Hello and welcome to Life Church Today. Life Church Today wants to make a lasting difference in your life, in our community, and in the world. Our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's how Life Church Today is able to make a difference in the lives of so many people, and it's the motivating dynamic behind everything that we do. You see, church isn't merely a building, it's the people. So we aim to bring church to you. We meet around the globe online and in physical locations throughout America. No matter how and where you join Life Church today, you will find friendly people who are excited to get to know you as you become part of the Life Church family. And wherever you are in life, you matter to God and you have a purpose to fulfill. Life Church today wants to help you become the person God has created you to be. Every journey, including yours, has a next phase and will help you discover it. It could start with simple things like serving, praying, or writing, finding God's vision for you. You will not have to take the next step by yourself. With a solid community of friends, you can smile, grow, and serve with people who sincerely care about you. Enjoy the sermons, read the devotions, reach out and contact us. We respond to every single person who writes us or find a group to join you on your faith journey. Worship, give, and love. Our community and world. We are excited about serving the world's community and offering God's love to people of all backgrounds, whether online, in person, individually, or in groups. Within our church and around the globe, we are focused on supporting and engaging in relationships that provide assistance and restoration to the hurting world. Our caring leadership team, including lead pastor Mike Robinson, works together to shape the vision and direction of Life Church today. Pastor Robinson, author of 40 books, serves with a team of enthusiastic and educated ministers using their numerous years' experience. They aim to serve you and your whole family. Visit lifechurchtoday.com. The book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Hear the reading of God's holy and fallible word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Blessed be the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Keep that outline handy. We're going to be talking about vision. First off, we're going to talk about what we don't do with vision. One of the main reasons you and I fail to receive God's vision in our lives is because of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Maybe the best way to define it is by looking at the biblical character who focused on himself to the core, and that is the prodigal son. You can see his story in Luke chapter 15. Most of us know him as a prodigal son, but another name could be called Mr. Self-Centeredness. Here's a young man who apparently grew up in a stable home under the direction of a wise and godly father. He also had a brother who was a straight arrow and minded his own business. But he didn't have a bad life, yet one day he started to hear some voices from inside himself, and he became aware of an emerging vision or desires, a series of desires taking root in his heart, a vision for money, women, and the freedom of the flesh. And this vision both moved him and alarmed him. And this was a dream that he had of complete and total freedom that was taking over his soul. And you can see that in Luke 15. The spiritual coup led by his flesh and the enemy because he lacked a God-given vision for his life. And the voice in the deep recesses would whisper to him, Why do you put up with all this authority and structure in your life? Yes, Father. No, Father. Anything you say, Father, I'll get right on it, Father. The inner voice would say, why do you put up with all that? And why do you comply with your brother's request? You don't respect him or your father. The voice would say, your father and your brother, they're cramping your style. Why do you put up with them? And Why do you keep breaking your back for the family business? Why do you toil for them? There's faster money to be made elsewhere. Take a few shortcuts and find it. Now at first, when the prodigal heard these voices, it bothered him. And some of the ideas sounded deeply self-centered and a bit evil. But over and over, the voice would say, who's in control of your life? What vision do you have of your life from yourself? 
Who's setting up your agenda? Who's looking out for your interest? Who's looking out for your future? The voice would say, don't be dumb enough to say your father or your brother. Don't rely on them. They're just like everyone else looking for and after their own interest. The voice would say, when are you going to wake up and hear the bell and get a grip on doing your thing your way and not other people's way? And the voice would say, the only way you're going to live life to the fullest is by taking control yourself, by setting your own agenda, by taking the reins yourself, by being the captain of your own ship and pursuing your own self-centered vision for your life. It's time to make some things happen the way that you want them to happen. Ms. Flesh would challenge him and say, do you have the guts to do it or don't you? Are you going to take control of your own destiny or aren't you? How long are you going to allow others to control you and tell you what to do? And this type of thing probably pulled on him for months and months, trying to woo him out of his life of accountability with his family. At one point, he probably was tired and bored from a hard day's work, and this prodigal took a deep breath and followed his flesh. And he bought the lie. He was all in for himself. He chose a path of self-centeredness. He started hacking away at the Ten Commandments. Because first he asked for and received his full inheritance. And then he declared his independence from his father. Then he left his home and all of its comforts and the security of the family business and headed for the big city and the bright lights and wine, women, and song. And his wallet was full and stuffed with Benjamins. But he lacked a God-given vision for his life. He was doing it his own way. Off he charged in the future of his own choice. In a way that seemed right to him. He could hardly wait to carve out his own interpretation of the Mideastern dream. He was out to do it his way with his own power. With a strong sense of self-determination and self-reliance. He was all fired up when he went out the door. It was thrilling. It was a thrilling feeling to know that he's going out to do it his own way. Forget about God, forget about his family, forget about any divine plan. What really, really matters is his own plan, his own thoughts. And what we need to know is the first stages of a self-centered vision. Our feelings are all fired up. The ambers of selfishness burn brightly at the start of one's own agenda. The first phase of a self-centered purpose, there is this overflowing sense of optimism and excitement. All this intoxicating feelings of independence, total freedom, complete control. Nobody, nobody is going to tell me what to do. And this false sense of freedom is euphoric and it's addictive. It's powerful stuff. And you know what I'm talking about. It's that feeling of being all fired up because you're in control. It's a feeling of the middle school student feels when he cranks up the stereo to DEFCON 4 when his parents are gone. And the furniture is bouncing the sound from the sound, and the windows are ready to shatter. He's all fired up because he's on his own. His parents are gone for the weekend. It's a 16-year-old doing unthinkable things to his dad's Nissan. He got the keys and the power and the freedom, and dad's not in the passenger seat. This is the first phase of self-centeredness, and it's thrilling. And man, it's exciting. You feel almost invincible. You say... I can make the rules. I can call my own shots. I can forge my own future. Get out of my way. I answer to nobody. If I bow down to anybody, it's in front of a mirror, and a mirror alone, and nobody else. But somewhere I read, you shall not have any idols and bow down to any of them. Now, I'm not talking about moving ahead passionately with a God-given vision that He gives you. We're going to be talking about the next few weeks. That God brings you and I his dreams and these visions and his destiny in front of you and you want to carry that out see we all must have goals and dreams and visions inspired by God so to reach out to his high calling that God has given you to live a life of passion for God and the things of God whether it's your business or your marriage or your family or your career or your social life or your ministry to have a vision for those things is very very important vision and passion are good but self-centeredness is a completely different thing Self-centeredness is that runaway sense of sovereignty over your own life, over your own future, while kicking God out of the pilot's chair and trampling the first three commandments that God gives. And far too often, we clearly captain our own ship. We call our own shots. We make our own plans without ever consulting the one who holds our future in his hands, and that's God. The one who knows all and knows us better than we know ourselves. God who has a divine purpose for you, for you. 
It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. I don't want God's will. I don't want His program. I want my agenda and nothing else. So the first phase of self-centeredness is euphoric. It's pleasurable. But you can see on your outline in Proverbs 14, 12, it says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. Wow. So it seems right to you. It comes from you. It's part of who you are. You don't want to hear from anybody else because it's from you. So the first important part of the vision process is knowing what not to do. Don't go by your own ideas and your own ways unless it lines up with Scripture and be tested with other people's ideas and their opinions and their counsel. Don't make any big decision without talking to mature spiritual people in your life first. Don't tell them, I've already made this decision, but tell them, this is what I'm thinking about and praying about. I think it lines up with Scripture because of this reason, that reason, and I want your honest opinion. Now, asking someone's opinion doesn't mean you have to go by it. You just utilize that as part of the counseling process. So the prodigal son did not do that. He moved into the phase when he partied and slept away his fortune, the phase of pain and problems. He found himself friendless and famished. The bright lights of the city had dimmed. And there was no one around him anymore that cared for him. Those who hung out with him only cared about his money. But once the money was gone, they were gone. All of a sudden, he faced disaster and pain. It wasn't supposed to unfold this way. Not with me in charge. But it went south. It soured. It left him confused. And everyone here can give a witness to the painful complications that resulted. When you puffed out your chest in a self-willed way and made an independent decision without consulting God or consulting anybody else. And you said, I'll show the world, I'll, I'll do it my way, get out of my way, I'm in control. But it backfired, it got complicated. It left you and others in a pile of hurt. It was a bad deal, a bad move, a bad lead and a bad decision. And selfishness always starts off with pleasure and fleshly desire, delights, but then it gets complicated and gets painful. It's exciting to be your own little false god, your own little lord. But the proverb reminds us there's a way that seems right to man, but leads to death. Trying to be sovereign lord over your own life is like putting a four-year-old in control of a jumbo jet. The kid is ill-equipped to handle the complexity of a 747. And whether you like to hear it or not, we are ill-equipped to handle the controls of our own life. To handle how complex life gets without divine direction is a real, real problem. And that's one reason God gives us His Word and He gives us guidance and He tells us to talk to Him. As ludicrous as it would be to allow a four-year-old to take control of a jumbo jet, it's just as ludicrous to tell God, I can sit in the pilot seat of my life and do a better job than you. Leave me alone. I can figure out my path, my way, and my direction. And God says, no. Don't go that way. And the fact is, a card carrying me first man or woman is going to crash. It's not a matter of if, just a matter of when. Right. Right. Maybe one year, maybe five years, it's hard to say. Or will the crash occur on Judgment Day when it's the eternal crash? I don't want to stand before a holy God on Judgment Day and tell God my personal song was, I did it my <laughs> way. I didn't need you. My favorite magazine was Self. I don't want to tell him that. I wouldn't want to explain why I bought the whole lie of self-centeredness, the deception that I could be my own little false God, ruling sovereignly over my own life completely and utterly, and not hearing anything from God. I'd hate to stand before the awesome, magnificent God and explain why I only bow down in front of a mirror. Having to say that on Judgment Day would redefine the word regret. On that day to see the majesty of God explode in front of your eyes and for the first time you perceived how glorious and wonderful he is and you realize that you never bowed down to him or ever wanted to hear his opinion in your life when I stand and gaze upon that crystal throne I don't want to be a little false God living in my life with my arms crossed in defiance but I want to be one who utterly every single day needs Jesus. Amen. And you can hear a thousand sermons or read a dozen books, self-help books on marriage and relationships. But it all comes down to this for the Christian. Number one, that you try to follow Jesus. And number two, you tell everybody in your life 
that you need Jesus every single day. Amen. In other words, you need a Savior every day. You don't have it all together. You have your flaws. You're mistake prone. You make your mistakes. You make your errors. We all do. And that's why I need Jesus every single day. If you can communicate that to your children and to those you love, they'll start seeing Jesus more and more in your life. Instead of this false idea that, well, I got it together. I'm a really religious person. And look at me how holy I am. No, 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 no. You need Jesus every day. Follow him. But make sure everybody around you knows. You know you don't have it together. But you know the one who has it completely together, and that's Jesus. It's that simple. With all your relationships, uh, if you can imprint that in your relationships, you're going to see things grow and grow. You're going to have a whole list of things to do, and a lot of them are good. A lot of them are pulled from the Bible. But if it doesn't have that, it's going to lead to destruction. Self-centeredness promises a kind of simplicity. It says you don't have to get all involved in what God says. It doesn't matter if it's right with your kids or with your family or with your pastor or those that are in your life that have spiritual maturity. It doesn't matter what they say. Do it your own way. See this promise of simplicity, no relational entanglements with God. Nobody cramping your style. But that false promise of freedom eventually translates into isolation and intense loneliness and then bondage and then destruction. In your time of greatest need, loneliness, a haunting, oppressing loneliness. And that's what happened to the prodigal. Here in this story, he ran out of money. His rented friends left. He realized that he already burned all the bridges with his family. And so now in his time of greatest need, he sits in a pile of rubble all alone with nobody there around him who cares. Sitting in the muck and the mire with the mud, blood and the pain on his face all alone. And that's what self-rule leads to. Yet the self-centered man or woman can't see it coming. They can't. They're singing my way. And then they hit the wall. And life caves in. The crash comes. And they scratch their head and say, where is everybody? The classic line of the self-centered person is, how come no one is here for me? What about me? Where is God? Where did God go? Where did everybody go? The Bible says if you live unto yourself, if you bow in front of your own mirror, and you blow off your earthly relationships and your heavenly relationships, your life takes a tragic turn, and you suffer, and you're immersed in pain and trouble and heartache. And in that lowest moment, you beg to hear a word from God. You yearn to receive a phone call from one of those loved ones that have been neglected. You ache for someone to come alongside you who cares. And all you will experience in the mud and the murk and the mire is... Sense around silence. The silence will be deafening. It's a price the self-centered man or woman pays. Now the final phase of the self-centered life is the decision phase. After the way that seemed right unto you, after the way that seemed right unto the master of the universe comes crashing down, and the future loses its luster, life unravels, the wheels start falling off, and you're at the lowest because the way was wrong, and now it's decision time. Some people are so hardcore that they will dress their wounds as best they can. They will bow down again in front of the mirror. They will roll up their sleeves and formulate a brand new self-centered independent plan and try to do it again their way. But some of the most spiritually ragged will do a cost assessment instead. They will reach the decision phase and they will be like the prodigal that says he came to himself. He came to his senses is what that means. They will reconsider, they'll reconsider everything and the prodigal comes to his senses and he understands that doing it his way was the problem. The prodigal saw himself for who he really was, a set my own agenda, a card carrying self-centered island of independence, ruling over a kingdom of one, unwilling to yield to any authority but himself. And so the prodigal looked into the mirror one more time and cried, I'm done bowing down to you. You're not omniscient and you're not even particularly wise. In fact, you're downright dangerous until you and I understand how dangerous we are without going by God's word and God and those he's placed in our lives around us. You're in for some more and more pain that's unnecessary. He said, I'm done bowing down to you. 
In my own reflection, I'm done fulfilling my own selfish ambition. I want God's purpose for my life, my marriage, my future. So in Luke 15, the once independent son heads home to his father. He learned the cost of self-rule, doing it my way. The cost was too high. I can't pay that premium. I'm better off at my father's house. It's just a servant. I'm tired of playing God. I'll let God be God. Let him have his way in my life. I'll seek his purpose and his vision for my life. I want to say to some of you here today, come to your senses. Get off the throne. Give God control of your life. Passionately ask God for his vision for your life. Instead of what you think you want. And tell God, please rubber stamp this. It's very, very simple to do. Where you're the controlling person. You think you have to control everything. Where you get honest between you and God. And say, Lord Jesus, you are wonderful. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You died for me and rose again. You have it all, Lord. And I have nothing without you. Lord, I simply want to turn from my ways and follow you. Amen. Have one final self-talk like the prodigal did and cry out. I'm tired of serving you. You are not the appropriate master of my life. You make me pay prices that are far too high. You exact a cost way over my capabilities. And that's what God would have you do today, wherever you are. It could be an area of a relationship. It could be your career. It could be a ministry. Whatever you want to go forward in, make sure you get God's vision first. Take some honesty. It takes some faith. It takes understanding that God's ways are better and higher than our ways. That Jesus truly knows the beginning of my life and the end of my life and everything in between. And he knows it with exact clarity he knows how it all fits together. He knows you better than you know yourself. So all you do is you say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I'm going to try every day to start my day out that way. That Jesus, you are truly Savior and Lord of my life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it touches our heart. It leads us. It directs us. We see our weaknesses and our flaws, and yet we see all your love and your grace and your mercy that we serve a living, loving Savior in Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't walked with him for a while, this is your opportunity. You know that he died on the cross for your sins. You know that he was raised again on the third day. You know that you're not God, that he is. So you simply come to him in faith, and you can say, in your own mind to the Father, you say, I believe. I believe in Jesus, Heavenly Father. I believe He died for me, and I believe He rose again on the third day. I give Him my heart and my life from this day forward. And for all of us Christians that we've done it our way, we've set our own agenda, we've looked at life through our own eyes and self-centeredness, that today that we would turn away from that and look to God's vision. That we'd say, Lord, I really, really want... Your vision for my marriage. Your vision for my family. Your vision for my business, Lord Jesus. Your vision for my ministry. Your vision for my social life. And your vision for my future, Lord. I really, really want that. I want to seek that with passion and zeal and great hope. Because I know how much you love me. That you love me no matter what I've done because of the cross. We ask that in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon.